Hello and welcome to Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maukwe Ogun Yusuf. For the past three editions of the program now, we've dwelt on the future of Nigeria, asking if Nigerians are hopeful for a better tomorrow, and if they are, what fuels their optimism. So far, we've spoken to two men who, despite belonging to different political parties, have served and are still serving in the highest echelons of government and their political parties. Tonight, however, we bring you fresh voices. My guests are women, millennials, and successful entrepreneurs. Arase Ugu is the founder of Smart Money Africa, a personal finance blog which caters to the African millennial and the author of two best-selling books, The Smart Money Woman and The Smart Money Tribe. She's also an executive producer of a TV series coming up soon, a serial entrepreneur and an advocate for financial literacy. Hear her thoughts on her experience on being a Nigerian so far and her hopes for the future. Arise, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you so much for having me. Well, dare I say <laughs> that I'm incredibly proud of the work that you've done. Thank you so much. Well, well, it always means so much to me when I meet women and they're like, oh my God, I read your book, it changed my life. Or it was so fascinating, well done. So I'm no, so... <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm admiring more the discipline <laughs> and the hard down. work. Yes, to actually, you know conceptualize what it is that you mm -hmm. want and put your thoughts to paper, to paper in a way that is very, very engaging. Well done on that. Thank you. Have you found people, though, saying to you, why are you leaking our secrets? I mean, <laughs> structure teaching people how to make money and grow their money. In whose interest is that? Well, I think it's going to be in all our interests. So I think typically um, all over the world, when, when it comes to financial services and giving out products and stuff, financial services people tend to focus on the financial jargon and most of the people that they're serving don't understand you know what they're buying or they don't understand how what it means to put money in an investment product it all goes over their heads and I thought okay you know what I have a finance background I'm really interested in women and you know money why not write something for women like me who want to live a good life but don't want to be poor so we have to learn how to systematically build assets that pro protect us in the future so my book is basically marrying the things that african millennials love which is lifestyle so it's fictional every woman i think african woman can see themselves in each character but each chapter also has smart money lessons and exercises at the end um, so that you sort of like learn about debt, about investing, about, you know, saving, about all the different issues like, you know, black tax, how the society, our friendships and families sort of take control of our money without us being in control of our money. And all the scenarios are there, <laughs> from the Ashray Bees yes. to the people who are partying to the funeral <laughs> scenario in this new book. Yes. I mean, all the scenarios are there. Uh, and you find that there are situations that are peculiarly African. Mm. Uh, what has the feedback been, especially in the aftermath of your new book? Have you, told people, have you heard people say, this is really the situation I found myself in and this mm -hmm. is how I was able to get out? Or do you have people saying, no, how those people actually got out was not realistic? Do you know what is so interesting? So the first book was honestly me just putting something out in the world and hoping that it did well. But how... The impact that it had and how everything went blew my mind completely. I didn't expect that I would go to countries like Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, and women are like, oh my God, you don't understand. This might be a Nigerian story, but I totally can relate to Adesua, or my friend is Lara, and this book has changed the way that I look at money and my financial life has made me more organized, it's given me clarity. And a lot of the experiences, because I went on a book tour to all these countries across Africa um, and across Nigeria as well. And I met different women that wanted to talk about Lara's situation. And, you know, in South Africa, for example, when Lara came up in conversation in my book tour events, they were like, listen, this is black ta tax. When I, um, I'm a first generation um, graduate in my family and in my family post apartheid, like none of, us, none of us have gone to university. But the thing is out the gates, I um, get a f my first job and they want me to use my credit card to 
pay for their lifestyle because and I feel obligated because they've sacrificed so much for me to be here and I realized that whether you are a South African woman a woman in Kenya a trader in worry you know a fashion designer in Lagos when it comes to money there's a common thread for African you know women and how we deal with it and the and how we experience it whether it's our families we're, we're more similar than we are different well i find it very interesting investing is you know you're mm. really big on investing but mm -hmm. there is no way you will invest in a in a political climate that is uncertain mm. and oftentimes you know i think uh, there's a huge question now about how young people are also getting involved in politics mm -hmm. uh you know I'm, I'm sure that you know you've been <laughs> you've been posed that question several times uh, about the political climate when it's mm. certain to invest. One post uh, caught my attention in Instagram was mm. your post. It was okay. a simple pie chart which showed how young Nigerians generally were um, responding to the situation in the country. Mm. I think uh, the pie chart said a huge percentage joined the mass ex exodus to the abroad, the <laughs> feverishly blamed the government. Stare into space and say, God, when? Turn on post notifications on Insta blog, complain with witty tweets, <laughs> and a very tiny percentage actually do something brilliantly innovate to change the country. Now, I'm just wondering, you schooled abroad. I mean, mm. your university degree was abroad, your mm -hmm. uh, first degree school, and your master's UCL, degree. Yeah. If anybody was going to relocate, would that be <laughs> you? Why haven't you? Well, the thing is, I don't know whether I'm a weirdo or not, but um, for me, my university degree was sort of a means to an end. I always felt like I was going to come back, you know, to Nigeria because I like being abroad like as much as the next person, but I've just never really seen myself, you know, living anywhere outside of Nigeria um, long term. Um, so I want to get, a, get an education and come back to Nigeria and make, you know, a difference. And I, I think that Nigeria is a very difficult place to have a career. It's a very difficult place to start a business because it's almost like you wake up in the morning and you have to eat, eat obstacles for breakfast. Nothing works <laughs> like it should. And you will know that because you're yeah. an entrepreneur. Yes, I am. And what is, but what I found about it is that it makes us very special people. We've become so resilient because because we expect problems, we're ready, you know, to go, go, go regardless. So if you have an idea, you know that you have to have plan A, plan B, plan C. If you think about it, because of the way Nigerians have been hardwired, that's why we do well in other countries. Like even people who have gone on this mass exodus, you find that they're thriving like in other environments because it's like you're finding a place where there's structure and, and it works. But it's forced us to be creative. The hard knock life has forced us to be, you know, creative about how we come up with ideas. It's like, okay, all these things don't work. What can we do to make it work? That's amazing. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the story of Tammy, for <laughs> yes. instance, a uh, fashion designer, and all her stories of woe, trying yeah. to get, you know, finance, family had supported, and, mm -hmm. you know, they were tired. This is your business. It's not it's working. Not working. <laughs> you know, go and get a job. And, you know, and that's how it is for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They have bright ideas. They're looking to, you know, get... Uh, extra money, they don't know where that source of funding is going to come from. Do you really think that we have structured help? I mean, you've talked about mm. the friends network. I mean, mm. Tammy was able to get through her friends, somebody who was able to believe in her, teach her to structure yes. her work and, you know, get the financing that she needed. But how available is that to the average Nigerian who is still saying, look, I can still make it here. I mean, mm. I think I want to put my head down. The market is here. Uh, the opportunities are here. And this is where I want to make it. How available is that to them? Well, I think, first of all, find my book because it gives you practical examples of how to start. I'm going to charge you to for <laughs> advertisement on this program. <laughs> but you can go how ahead. <laughs> how to, you know, structure your business for, to attract, you know, funding. And I'm not with, by any means saying that it's easy, but I'm thinking, I think that we now have access to so many resources to help us make it easier and to give us clarity as to how you know, to go about, um, you know, these things. I think there's no blueprint. We're always looking for a blueprint that's going to say, this is how you're going to make a hundred million. And it does not exist. <laughs> we have to 
have that idea, stick with it, create the structures that will allow it to thrive. You try, it doesn't work. You try another way. Like you have to keep strategizing and re-strategizing. How does the business world though respond to the political climate? We've been through quite a bit. Mm. There has been politics. There's been the time. If I mean, live, let's even leave the elections mm. alone. There was yeah. a time where restructuring was. I don't know if that penetrated <laughs> anyway into the business world or mm. into the world of investing, where there is uncertainty when people are not sure, not just in terms of how the market is going to do, mm. but in terms of the political climate, mm. uh, whether the country is going to be stable. Mm. Do, do they have that certainty in the world of business or do they pretend, well, this, this country is too big to fail anyway? Okay, I'll even start with this. With every uncertain market, it also creates, an, it also creates opportunities, right? So a lot of foreign direct investments, in theory, would like to invest in uncertain markets like, you know, Nigeria because the returns are higher. However, it also comes with a disproportionate amount of risk because you don't want your money to come in and then you can't take it out, right? And but so I think that the government really needs to start looking at the economy. One thing I think this government has not really focused on is fixing the economy. We can have all these different socialist, you know, policies, but people are ultimately worried about how they're going to get their next meal, about a, an environment for their um, businesses to thrive. So things like the MTN um, scandal. On one hand, I feel like from a Nigerian perspective, from an economy perspective, we should have made MTN list way sooner because they're making so much money from this country. They should, you know, be made to, you know, um, keep a lot of their money here so that we benefit from it and it trickles down. But on the other hand, when you put, you know, policies in place or sanctions in place that eventually basically scare off people who might say, you know what, Nigeria is kind of risky, but it's kind of stable. Let me um, bring my money here. You're scaring them away. And we need that foreign direct investment to be able to thrive. So I would love to see the government focus more on um, things that actually move the economy forward. Small businesses in Nigeria, whole industries have been started by individuals with no governmental help. Even with the <laughs> lack of infrastructure and all of that we see things you know like entertainment like beauty like these are industries that have basically sprung up and created <laughs> a vast you know income with jobs and and all of that for different people without any kind of um, government support and so basically they've thrived in spite of the governments and it's sad we instead of enabling them we now say let's increase taxes and make it more impossible for people to thrive and it's like the taxes that we're already paying if we were seeing where it was going we would be like oh yes you know let's you know let's pay more but it's almost like we're putting laws in place to cripple businesses as opposed to helping them thrive mm. so how would you um, what would you say is the long-term outlook for Nigeria vis-a-vis mm. uh, -vis mm. investment, especially when you look at the political um, mm. climate, so to speak? I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm very, very hopeful. I in, you know, I, in particular, believe in the Nigerian dream. I believe... Is that such that, a dream? Oh, yes. I believe that we live in a country that, in spite of everything that is not working we're creating whole industries i believe in the nigeria where you can come up with an idea without funding without governmental help without you people can actually push through and make it something right and i feel like that spirit that entrepreneurial spirit that we have because i've been to different countries you know in africa and i always laugh because i'm like when something goes wrong and I'm super like prepared for it. They're like, ah, what is, they're panicking and all of that. And I'm like, this is small fry compared to where me I'm coming from. And I realized from visiting other countries that the Nigerian entrepreneurial spirit is so special. And I think that that is what is going to see us through regardless, you know, of the obstacles. And I'm hopeful. I think that we have so many bright minds. We have a digital 
um, industry or a digital economy that is building regardless of the infrastructure that should be in place you know to support that and I can't even even imagine what we would be able to achieve when you know the right funds come or the right infrastructure comes so I'm, I'm hopeful we've gotten this far without with very little help so I feel like we will go further mm -hmm. you know going forward yeah.